crowdfunding space. He represents issuers, represents broker dealers. He really has been kind of in the thick of it, working with companies on IPOs, etc. Um, but the leading commentator, leading writer, leading educator in the space. Um, if you get Fox Business News, you've seen Brian Corn. Um, and by the way, not just a lawyer, he has a background as Uh, David Lillenfeld, who's, who's on the end here, um, has been really a leader, uh, probably one of the first, not the first, um, um But his specialty is in intellectual property, so we'll try our best to uh, not force him to second guess um, brain on the various issues. Kendall, of course, has introduced himself and uh, appropriately introduced himself. Um, but let's just face it, I mean, he's one of the leading commentators. You, lo you, look, you look out there, he's, he's written about it, he's been thinking about this for a long time and I'm really a great advocate for the industry. So I will, I guess, turn this over to Michael with the first question, which is so, equity crowdfunding, will this work and when? Um, this is this, okay, this is working, okay, good. Yeah, yeah I'm a very bullish on equity crowdfunding much. In fact, I'm, I don't know of anybody more bullish than I am on Title III equity crowdfunding, which is the, the SEC has not passed that yet, uh, but they will probably in, by August, I imagine, and that will enable investors, I mean, the mass, the mass consumers to basically make private investments and deals. So I'm very excited about that. I think the, the, equi the equity crowdfunding space, the, the, uh, I've been in the capital market since 1977 when I joined Merrill Lynch, fresh out of college. Uh, and I've seen a lot. I was on Wall Street, uh, actually underwrote IPOs, um, um, I've been an analyst, uh, I've been in, in a, in a portfolio manager. I created an algorithm that diagnoses, automatically diagnoses public companies for cash flow problems and I predicted the bankruptcies of uh, several companies including, you know, Lehman and uh, Bear Stearns and all these companies, all their problems a, a year before it happened using my cash flow metrics. That's purely my cash flow uh, 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 algorithm that I developed. But what I see, I'm really excited about um, um, crowdfunding because what's happened is the, it's, um, the, 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 the markets have, have opened up, are going to open up uh, due to the 80-year-old ban being lifted that the SEC put in place. So this advertising uh, is going to the enable the ability for the public for the first time in 80 years to advertise or the the issuers to advertise uh, to raise capital for the first time since 1933 uh, is going to enable uh, uh, it can open up a huge secondary market uh, a secondary capital market that I believe is going to dwarf the actual um, public markets within, you know, be within the next five to ten years. There's actually, uh, on my, uh, at onlinefinancialsector.com, there's actually a video on that site that explains what's the, what's going to happen um, with, the, the, it explains the relationship between equity crowdfunding and crowdfunding, finance crowdfunding, and it ties it to the, actually, the web back in 1995. This all started with the web in 1995. The web came along, it was, the, it was the Netscape unveiled the browser, uh, the population grew of internet users when they did that, the first commercial browser from 16 million to 360 million by, night, by 2000. And it took Yahoo, eBay, Amazon, all these companies up with it. And so the money here is, where, where the money's gonna be made is who's going to service those, all this huge crowd that's coming. I'm projecting the crowd's gonna grow from 200 million at the start of last year to 4 billion by 2018. That's a 20 times growth rate. 
and uh, and and of course the, the and, and the biggest area where I see the growth is going to be. I, I believe that we're going to see the, the crowdfunding channel, like the home shopping channel for Title Three deals. That's what I see where this is going, and uh, and I I believe it's going to unleash just a tremendous uh, uh, um, uh, amount of, of of deals that are going to get done. So I'm very very bullish. Mm -hmm. I want to, uh, I guess, throw it over to David because you um, have had experience, obviously, over the last couple of years here in, in Georgia. Um, do you share that same uh, uh, optimism and what do you think the challenges are to get from here to there? Yeah, I mean, obviously I'm bullish on equity crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding, debt crowdfunding. I think that um, the, the JOBS Act, implementation of the JOBS Act, which has not happened yet, will be key to building the momentum that we need. So equity crowdfunding here in Georgia has been um, slow. The rules have been around for um, two and a half years. Um, the first portal, we were the first portal to come on and that was um, about a year and a half ago. We have a ton of companies that are interested in um, equity crowdfunding in the state of Georgia. What we don't have and what we're working on doing is building awareness of crowdfunding among the investor community. So that's really what the slowdown, in my view, has been. But I think that nationally, um, the long-term view um, or prediction for crowdfunding is, I think, is going to be huge. It's a much easier way to raise capital. It's a much easier way for people who are kind of outside the normal um, networks that could raise capital will be able to get money, money for their company. So obviously, I'm I'm very bullish on it. It's been s it's been a slower start than people had expected, but I think equity crowdfunding is still going to be strong and going to be here. But we need implementation of the Jobs Act to really get us to the mass level that we need. Do you agree with that, Kendall? Well, I, I'm bullish on equity crowdfunding eventually. You know, my concern is that in order for it to become bullish for all of us, it, there needs to be some changes. But ultimately, what's really interesting about this is when you talk, to, it depends on who you're talking to, and that's what I think is the most interesting thing about this. If you go to a broker dealer, or if you go to a banker, or you go to the traditional investment world, they're going to tell you equity crowdfunding is never going to work. This is the stupidest thing in the world. No one's going to do it because, of course, it's taking money out of their pocket and it's changing an industry dramatically. So they're the naysayers. Unfortunately, they're a very powerful group of naysayers. And the beautiful thing about crowdfunding is it doesn't rely on those people. It doesn't rely on the traditional markets. It doesn't rely on the bankers. It doesn't rely on us lawyers that are up here. It relies on the crowd, the people. And so when I got involved in this, you know, a couple of years ago, I took it upon myself to go out and try to educate the masses as much as possible. That's why I write for a very popular magazine, Entrepreneur, not an industry magazine, Compliance Week or something like that. I get quoted in there, but I'm talking to the masses. I'm trying to teach people what's out there because ultimately this is going to work if the people, the crowd wants it to work. And so I think it's very important that we all stay bullish on it and ignore the naysayers. Look, yeah, there's some things that are wrong with this law. They'll get fixed. Yeah, the SEC may not like the law. It's going to be fixed. It's going to work. And in the meantime, you have great innovators in the states that are going, all right, let's fix these problems now. Let's create a model that'll work. And then ultimately, parts of the Jobs Act are already working. You know, Title II is working. It may not be working as big as people think, but it's working. Title IV is going to be phenomenal. Title III is going to work eventually. It may not work right at the beginning the way everyone wants it to, but it will. So everyone needs to stay focused on pushing this forward, I believe, educating the masses to understand it, because that's where ultimately the power is going to come from. All right. So, Brian, I am... Um now, now you, you could touch on every single one of these topics, but you are obviously uh, someone who's been very active in a lot of organizations and, and have written not for Compliance Week, but you are, are well known as an expert in this area. Um, I want to talk, though, first about interstate crowdfunding a little bit about 
um, you know, David's experience here, and not to step on tomorrow's panel, but a little bit about David's experience here, and then your thoughts about how interstate crowdfunding can work and, and what you're trying to do about it. So interstate crowdfunding is, is interesting because it uses a very little known uh, up till now a exemption from the federal securities laws, which states that if your offering is only contained to a single state, uh, then you need not register with the SEC. Uh, this had not been used very widely in the past uh, until the crowdfunding movement seized on it. And I think it seized on it as a reaction to Title II and Title III, just so that everyone is aware. Title II is the ability to raise money from accredited investors only. Title III is your ability to go out and raise money from the general public. The proposed rules on Title III are extremely onerous. Uh, there are burdens in place that are matched with raise limits and investment limits. Um, I have uh, uh, a few materials in the other room which you can pick up on the CFPA table uh, which, which delve into details on, on what exactly you have to do to comply with Title II and Title III. But it, it's all about the money. And if the people and the investors and the companies can make money, then, uh, then it will work. Um, the prevailing view right now is that Title, II, Title III is, is so burdensome that absent some particular circumstances that we've discussed, for example, uh, the TV show where you're investing from home just like you can vote on uh, Dancing with the Stars or American Idol, um, that has potential because you can get scale uh, and you're also going to be able to raise amounts that will pay the professionals. Um, a company that is looking to raise capital, though, in an ordinary sense, uh, has to pay a funding portal in the Title III world. They have to file with the SEC. They have to make ongoing reports with the SEC. And it makes it one of the more expensive ways to raise capital as compared to other mainstream sources. So I think that uh, interest date is a response to that uh, by stating that you don't have to go to Title III. You can still go to the public as long as you keep your offering within a single state. The SEC came out or some staff members at the SEC who, who speak at conferences, quote, off the record, but then they're, they're broadcast, um, <laughs> have, have expressed the view that anything that is not confined to the state would be a per se violation, and therefore you can disclaim away the uh, it, transaction is only made in Georgia, uh, we're only accepting investors in Georgia, similar to gaming laws where you can only, invest, you can only play uh, uh, casinos online in the state of New Jersey, Delaware, and Nevada. Um, the, the question will be kind of who wins that battle, and eventually if, uh, if the SEC decides to take action against the states, uh, which is something that uh, they are thinking about but haven't expressed a view, probably because people at the SEC don't themselves agree. Um, what, what I think will work with interest date, and, and one of the burdens I think of interest date is also that you have to be incorporated in the state uh, where you're doing the transaction. and so. Uh, if you look at the Invest Georgia flyer, uh, there's a, a very good layout of, of, of what, what's required. But if I'm in New York, I can't go to Georgia very easily and raise money in a Georgia transaction. Uh, I am working with the Crowdfunding Professional Association, which is a very good organization. Uh, Charlie in the back is the president. Uh, feel free to talk to him. Um, and uh, what we're working on is something that would be a uniform uh, state exemption, state crowdfunding statute. and that would enable the laws of each state to be more or less the same or very similar to each other, similar to other uniform statutes, Uniform Partnership Act, Uniform Commercial Code, so that there's some predictability of the laws from each state. You don't have to hire 50 law firms to figure out what the rules are. Um, many states have put out their own interest state exemptions, Georgia, Michigan, Maine, for example, uh, uh, Kansas, I believe, and a handful of others are considering it. And I think that it would serve the, prof the profession well to standardize the rules a little bit so that everyone can be more or less on the same page. But uh, long story short, I think it has great potential. I think that it will only work in states that have a critical mass of population who are engaged in online uh, investing. Uh, a lot of people out there have never heard of Kickstarter, have never heard of Lend Lending Club, uh, don't know what crowdfunding is. Uh, we, we sometimes live in a little bit of a bubble in that sense. And so I think awareness uh, over time will definitely help. 
You know, Michael, you, you win the most optimistic on the panel award, and so I want to go back to you and like kind of explain in your thought process about where that growth comes from. What sort of companies do well, you see? Here's what's going to happen. I, I was, uh, on, when, while I was in Wall Street, I was underwriting small public companies, practically almost venture capital stage public companies. This thing is working, right? Okay. And what I found is that um, there are so many people out there that understand the leverage that you can get a get the the, le the leverage that the reason why I like Title Three is you can raise a hundred grand. Anybody in this room can go out tomorrow and come up with an idea and put it out there and start. You know, they can call their uncle, they can call their nephew, they can call their brother and say, "I got this idea." And you know, because we're all so closely connected, there's some entrepreneur that's going to want to link up with them. So what's going to happen is the guy's going to come up with an idea. He's going to come up with a partner. So hey, listen, we can raise a hundred grand for this thing. I think angels will put, put the will will put up capital just to do this. Then you go out under Title Three. You put up float an ad. You raise your first hundred. Okay. Now, we, but the whole goal here is to raise a million dollars. It's not to you know people are looking at Title Three as a hundred, five hundred, and a million. I'm saying that's not going to work that way. People are going to go out and raise a hundred. Okay, we've got all our ducks in a row. Let's get our audits. Let's get all this done with the first hundred. Now we're going to get the five hundred, which only requires a review. And now we're going to go get the next five hundred that requires the audit. That's the way it's going to work. And guess what? We can do that every year. So the, 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 there's going to be opportunists who are going to come out of the woodwork. To be, and, 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 and what's going to happen? You're going to see a lot of deals are going to get funded much faster because, again, from what you said, yeah, the, the, if you go to Wall Street, they're all naysayers on things. But you know, what's, what there's, what I'm reading about crowdfunding out there is what I read about the web when it was growing between '96 and 2000. And I can't tell you how many analysts I read about who said Anal Amazon's going to go out of business. I mean, there was people out there that were selling Amazon short because they thought it was going out of business in 1997 and 1998. So. Yeah, the key is that's why I'm so excited about it. Is that's what's going to generate this, and there's going to be a lot more come out of the woodwork than people can even conceive right now. I believe. You know, one of the things that I've <laughs> preached and written about, and and I'm going to get Kendall your comments on this, is uh, that standardization in the equity space is critically important because obviously debt is very easy to un understand. You know, you have a certain risk of default, but you have a certain interest rate. Equity, on the other hand, is a little bit different, and so. I argue that you're going to see standardization of, of deals in the Title III space, um, which creates a legal tension with whether or not the portals can promote that standardization. Do you agree or disagree, Kendall, with that, with that notion that we'll start to see standardized deals? In I, I think you're going to have to, to a certain degree, for the, especially as Michael's talking about, the smaller, you know, the 100,000. Th that's why I got into this. I mean, those were the people I used to help in my law firm. This was the mom and pops who needed $100,000 to start a business, not $10 million. Mm -hmm. These are people that wanted to open up a little yogurt stand or a, you know, a ice cream store or something in, in Tampa. And they needed 100, 150 grand, maybe even 50 grand. And that's, it, for those people, if they don't have a standardized model, it's gonna be very difficult because they can't go hire a law firm to create a, you know, a cap table and tell them this is how you're gonna structure your debt and you know, all those things. So these standardized models will come out and I think part and parcel of that will be a more standardized way for people in the equity crowdfunding world to do business valuation, which is gonna be a big necessity. You know, I mean, we all know business valuation is voodoo 90% of the time for a startup. Hey, my company's worth, I haven't done anything, but my company's worth $10 million, okay? I can tell you right now, FundHub is launching in two weeks. It's worth $25 million. We haven't ra made a penny yet. But no, I mean, that's, that's what people do. They say it's this random thing so they can justify their, their equity structure. There's going to be the need for standardization for smaller deals to be able to go to the public and say, I'm selling 5%, 10%, whatever it is, but there's something in place where people understand it and get it. David, from your perspective, because you're dealing with issuers and things like that, is that is that notion that, hey, you, you kind of have to do it our way, is that accepted by the, the issuers that you're working with and do you see that changing? Um, well, interesting, on the, on the investor side, what we see a lot of times is folks 
I mean, I've had people say to me, well, I, I put in $1,000. Oh, by the way, what, what percentage of the company do I own? I mean, it's almost an after the fact because right. you're not dealing with enough money that folks that on the investor side that they're going to get down. And Kendall said they're not going to go out and hire a lawyer. What I would tell you is they're probably not even going to read the documents. So, I mean, it's a lot of, it's going to be similar to like, you know, and there's these consumer contracts all over the place, credit card companies and your, your internet provider and all that. Nobody really sits and reads the fine print. And <laughs> so I think, so standardization, yes. Um, we don't tell issuers that here are the terms that you need to be in your offer. We have a starter document and it has some kind of multiple choices. So, um, and they get to pick what they think is appropriate for their for their company, what they want to do. They can work with their lawyer. We encourage the issuers to seek counsel on the um, on the offer document. So, it, it needs yes, it needs to be simplified, but I don't think it needs to be dummied down terribly because, like I said, the investors are interested in you know they want to be treated fairly, and they will have trust in the issuers. They will have trust in the portal that the deal they're entering is reasonable and fair. I don't think they're gonna get into the minutia of the deals though. You know, one, one area that um, I, I've done a lot of, like reading and writing is kind of this trend to crowdfund people, you know, and, and take future amounts of their re revenue from an entrepreneur who might be younger, who might be out of school, who just is starting up. And uh, I wanna kick this over to to Brian, because um, he obviously has some insight into this new emerging area, which is, I guess, crowdfunding the equity of people rather than companies. I mean, one, one thing you're definitely seeing is diversity in terms of asset class. So it started out as Kickstarter rewards crowdfunding. Uh, now you have debt. Debt is, is blowing into consumer and commercial within commercial. Uh, you're seeing uh, all, all different asset types. And so uh, the mainstreaming, I guess, of, uh, of investment types is, uh, is a trend. One thing that's, that's new is that um, firms have seized upon this notion that I don't want to read your slides and I don't understand what you're trying to do, but I believe in you and I think you will be successful. And it's uh, started out, there's a company called Pave.com where they have uh, rising stars for people who are in their uh, early 20s, some are in college, some are just out of college, and you can actually invest in whatever it is they're going to do. Uh, and you may not know what it is, but uh, you can see that they're on the Harvard Law Review or that they're uh, in a successful uh, business venture. And uh, they will give you uh, a percentage of their income over a certain period of time in exchange for an upfront cash payment. And what PAVE says is that's much better than a loan. A student loan is a fixed amount, and who knows if your job's going to support that. Um, this is something that is always affordable because it's 10% of your income. If your income is low, you pay that amount. If your income is high, you pay 10% of that amount. Uh, and you don't have to pay if you're uh, making.